Uh, hey, everyone. Uh, so welcome to our presentation. Uh, we are group two, also known as Heartbreakers. Uh, my name is Colin, and our project is on improving heart disease outcomes in the United States. Um, so here's our group. Um, that's me, Hang, Ben, and Grace, who you'll meet in a moment. And there's our information in case you want to access that later, but let's jump right in. So properly diagnosing patients who present to the ER with chest pain is a complicated problem. The medical community has done such a good job of educating the public on the symptoms of heart attacks that only about 10% of patients with chest pain in the ER are actually having a heart attack. Generally, that's a good thing, but doctors have to make a difficult decision for each of these patients, uh, and more patients creates more pressure on that system. A admitting someone who is not having a heart attack is a huge cost for both the hospital and the patient, and huge opportunity cost for taking up a bed that someone else might need more. But sending someone home when they are having a heart attack is probably the worst case scenario for any ER ever in the history of hospitals. So that creates also, you know, in addition to the danger for someone's life, it creates liability for doctors and hospitals. Um, so to solve that problem, a cardiologist named Lee Goldman dug into some patient data in the 1970s to try to find a more efficient way to make these decisions. And he came up with like a basic decision tree that proved a lot better than doctors at these diagnoses. And you can see it there on the right. Um, so three key points we took from, from this little story is that this type of diagnosis is really expensive, difficult, and important. Um, doctors don't always get it right. And some form of machine learning model has proven to perform better than doctors. Uh, so that kind of got us thinking, can we mimic that type of result with our own model? So we created a hypothetical client with funding to create heart health clinics. Um, and our job was to create a machine learning model to diagnose patients at clinics with heart disease, and then recommend where the best locations were to place these clinics to help at risk or in need populations. So this raised some key questions right away, uh, like what risk factors most influence heart disease rates, and how are we going to balance the importance of these factors with helping the maximum amount of people, specifically helping people in need like people of low income or people uh, without insurance. So these first three data sets were all used in some form to determine our clinic location. So the first is from the Census Bureau and has insurance and income information. It calls the Census API at that, uh, the proper link to get that table. Uh, and the other two are from the CDC and provide lots of info on the risk factors we dove into. The first at a state level and then the second at a general metropolitan level. So the Databricks we use to clean them, uh, call the file and download uh, that, you know, the files at those URLs directly, which means all three of these data sets have fully automated ETL. So all you'd need to do if you wanted to repeat all the cleaning we've done is to run our Databrick again, uh, and it will call that exact URL and do all of our steps uh, over again. Um, and then the last data set was used for the machine learning model. That was found on Kaggle and provides heart disease classification features. Um, and all four of these data sets ended up in our SQL database uh, for further use after the proper cleaning steps were taken. Um, so here's a diagram of our data pipeline that we created for our live patient data. Um, that, that, that's the pipeline. Um, so to create an ML model, the patient data was, was first read in from the class data lake. Uh, and then you'll see that the top half there is when the model is created and trained on 75% of the data. That model was exported to Power BI to be used on new data. And then that new data comes from the bottom half of the pipeline. So from the other 25%. So we've got a data brick that loads that 25%, um, selects n random records from it, and then saves one patient at a time to a directory in our data lake. Um, and then our data factory is set up to, to look at that data lake, uh, to look at that directory and, and rerun every time that file's updated. So every time there's a new patient in that, in that lobby, in that system, this little red box at the bottom runs. Um, so it reads in an entry, produces it to the Kafka server, and then consumes it um, back to simulate real patient data, sort of as if several patients at several different clinics around the US were sort of getting pushed into the system one after another. Um, so finally, the consumer appends the new that new record to the undiagnosed patients table in our SQL database. And from there, these patients can be read into Power BI and diagnosed by our model. So now I'll pass it off to Hannah to talk more about our ML model. Thank you, Colin. Um, we decided to split up the heart prediction data set such that 75% of them is used for ML training and the remaining 25 is used for validating the model. So before feeding in the data into the model, we examined the data set for any missing values or outliers. We found that out of 688 records, 128 of them have missing values on the cholesterol column. So we decided to impute those missing values using the means of individuals of the same gender and within the age range of plus or minus 10. 
However, this method reduces the importance of cholesterol in predicting heart disease. Um, we then balance the data set and normalize the data to improve its accuracy and precision of our model. And finally, we created dummy variables for the categorical data. See, the predicting outcome um, is either one or zero, meaning you have heart attack or don't. Hence, it's a binary classification problem. So we tested the performance of seven different models suitable for classification using a method called five-fold cross-validation. The scoring metrics are shown in the table below, and the scores, as you can see, are very close. But since a uh, support vector classifier, or SVC, has the highest average score, and is, it is suitable for a small data set with multiple dimensions, we decided to adopt SVC as our ML model. And in attempts to improve the performance of our chosen model, we tuned the hyperparameters using a method called grid search. And although tuning slightly increases the um, precision and sensitivity, it affects negatively on the accuracy and the Matthews correlation coefficient, which measures the quality of our prediction. Moreover, from the confusion matrix on the right here, although the two model has two extra cases of true positive, its benefits is outweighed by the six extra cases of false negative. Therefore, we decided that the model should be kept on tuned. So another method to improve the performance of our model is through feature reduction. To do that, we obtain an overview of permutation feature importance. And this graph allows us to identify features in the data with weak contribution to the prediction. And eliminating those data will reduce the noise introduced to the model, thus improving the model's performance. So we deleted the features highlighted in gray right here. And the result is a boost in performance across all scoring metrics. And this is a finalized version of our ML model ready for heart disease prediction. And next up, Ben will walk us through the predictions we're done using the ML model. Thanks, Hang. Yeah, like you said, we used the training or the test data set from the SQL database and connected it to Power BI. And we're able to use Power BI's Python script capabilities to apply our machine learning model to it. And we found some interesting things. The first category of features we looked at were patient ECG readings. Um, and as you can see, old peak is a reading off an ECG, and it's much higher in those with predicted heart disease than those without it. Um, same goes with normal and abnormal ECG readings. The results, the normal results are much lower in those with predicted heart disease and the abnormal results as combined are much higher. Um, another important thing from the ECG reading that was an important classifier was the ST segment slope. In those with predicted heart disease, it was found to be flat much more often than down or up. And in those with no predicted heart disease it was found to be up. The next category of features we chose to look at were patient vital data. Um, and we found that those with asymptomatic chest pain were much more likely to be um, diagnosed with predicted heart disease using our model. Um, average blood pressure and average max heart rate were found to be very similar between the two classifiers. Um, and fasting blood sugar levels were much lower in those, or lower than a certain threshold in those with predicted heart disease as well as exercise-induced angina being found more often in those with predicted heart disease. The last category of features we chose to look at were demographic features such as sex and age. And we found that males are much higher to be, or much more likely to be predicted with heart disease than females are, as well as those of a higher age bracket. Um, now I'll hand it off to Grace, who will take us through a state and metropolitan breakdown. Thank you, Ben. So in order to implement this model, our group decided to place clinics um, and we needed to find where there was most need and most risk for heart disease. So we use the CDC and census data to find all of these indicators, such as what Ben just described, age and sex, as well as other economic and behavioral health risks. So here is a list of some of those risks. For each of those, we made a map in Power BI here um, and grouped the highest risk and highest need states um, and gave the highest two scores. So the red states here 
received a score of one and the dark blue states got a score of 0.5. For each of the indicators or risk factors, we then added the, all of their scores together. Um, as you can see, California, Florida, and Texas had some of the highest scores in economic and demographic need, while Arkansas and West Virginia had some of the highest uh, health risks. We then did the same process at the metropolitan level, finding um, risk factors and need, um, creating maps and color uh, coding the high risk, assigning those scores. And as you can see over here, the Texas uh, city once again had a high economic need while cities in West Virginia had a high behavioral health need. Um, and so then, because our goal is to find cities that will serve, put clinics in cities that will serve the most amount of people, we decided to multiply that score by the metropolitan area's population and divide by a million, with this list being our recommendation of cities to place clinics in, um, with two of those cities again in Texas, uh, Florida coming up because of the population, but the two cities in West Virginia do still make the list. In conclusion, um, our ML model, which has a high accuracy, is meant to relieve pressure on doctors uh, diagnosing heart disease. Our age and, age and sex are strong indicators of heart disease, which are factors used to recommend clinic locations. These clinic locations are largely based on population, in the future, we would like to use uh, wait times in emergency departments to, as another indicator of need for these clinics. And we would also like to make an ML model with real streaming patient data if given the resources. So uh, that is our presentation. Thank you guys all for coming. Do we have any questions? That was fascinating. I, I, was, I was over here trying to even look into some of your, your data further because it was just so interesting. I'm, I now feel like I need to um, have you send me your report so I can mark down all of these indicators and then you know visit my doctor and ask when they can uh, run a, an ECG on me. So I'm curious, um, what, what to you was the most shocking or most surprising data point as you worked through this? Um, I can take away on that. Um, I think one of the most surprising one is really on the cholesterol column, because just based on research and based on intuition, you would expect that people with high cholesterol levels would be more likely to get heart disease or cholesterol have a high correlation of heart disease. However, from our data set, it's not really the case. Um, we uh, like I talk about, we use feature reduction to improve the accuracy of our model. And we actually reduce or deleted the cholesterol column from our training data set because it's irrelevant or even introduce a lot of noise that would um, reduce the accuracy of our model. I think the reason um, is that because we have a large quantity or percentage of cholesterol that's missing, um, we had to impute that with the mean, and that really reduced its importance in predicting the model. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I thought that was interesting as well as I was um, trying to catch some of the data around um, like glucose levels too. You would, I, I don't know why in my mind you'd associate issues with glucose, with diabetes, which, you know, you might assume could create additional stress on the heart, right? I, so I thought that was pretty interesting as well. Um, was there data that when you were looking through your set, you wish you had that was missing? Yeah, I, I can take that. One. Yeah, I think so. I think one of the one of the key things that we noticed right away was that so the original point of the project was to predict heart attacks, right? Because like that that anecdote at the beginning is about heart attacks, and heart disease isn't specifically heart attacks. It can be a lot of other things, um, but obviously heart attacks are a really important possible symptom of heart disease. Um, and the best data we could find was sort of generally predicting heart disease. Um, so I think if we had, if we could find more data, like real, um, I, I think Grace briefly said it, but like real patient data from, from hospital 
you know, emergency rooms, like with people like presenting with chest pain, because I think like, like Ben said, you know, asymptomatic was a big indicator of heart disease, which like doesn't really make sense. Um, but I think that's because, you know, a lot of these people weren't just weren't having problems, but maybe we're just at their doctors and getting diagnosed with heart disease. Right. So I think that kind of changes the function of the clinics a little bit. They're not purely like a middleman for hospitals. They're also just like, if you have long-term concerns about your heart health, this is where you can go to figure out like, do I, am I in the realm where I need to see a doctor? But they, you know, they could also function as I'm having some chest pain. I don't want to run right to the hospital. Like, am I actually at risk here based on these factors? What do you recommend? Can I just go see a doctor tomorrow? Can I just take what some nitroglycerin or whatever, whatever the, the heart attack medicine is? So I don't know. I just think um, with, with some real heart attack patient data, um, a slightly different model uh, based around that would have been cool. Uh, but I think certainly the function of this is, is really obvious and still really necessary and kind of like tangential to the original goal. So, yeah. Thank you, Colin. So I asked the, the last group this, if you could go back and um, start this project over two weeks ago or two and a half weeks ago, what would you do differently um, or, or how might you um, change what you work towards? And we'll start with Grace. Yeah. Um... So I guess to be completely candid, our group definitely started pretty jumbled. Um, we jumped back and forth kind of between topics before this was actually our first topic and we landed back here again. And so we really did know that we kind of had this path um, made to the point that a lot of our planning was doing. And so I think have, having gone back, having a more developed planning session would probably be the way that I would do it because it ended up working out for us really well. But I know that in all situations, that is not necessarily the case. Yes. Excellent. Thanks, Grace. Ben. Yeah, I would agree with what Grace said. Um, those first three days, we kind of planned three different projects looking at heart disease as a whole, um, stroke prediction, and then even designing uh, an exercise app that would take in Fitbit data and calorie data. Um, but I, I think I would also agree with what Colin said too, is that like going back, it, it would be good to be able to plan around kind of this idea of general heart disease as opposed to more specifically heart attack, um, because heart attack data is very interesting. And if we were able to pinpoint in on that, it would be a much more concise model, I feel like. Um, yeah, but overall we overcame the problems and I think it turned out really well, so. Absolutely. Colin, how about you? Yeah, I would definitely echo both what Grace and Ben said. The first three days were, uh, they were a, definitely a struggle, but we, we ended up figuring it out in the end. I think, I guess I would add to that, that I would, I would like to, um, if we had more time, like figure out, um, a, a more rigorous way to select locations where we can actually help the most people, because I mean, you know, look, that slide really, we kind of, we kind of came up with that. We were like, if we want, we want to get those high ranking States and cities, and we want to wait by population, but we're not really sure like what makes sense. Um, you know, some data that might help would be like wait times in ERs in different cities, right? So like if we, if we could have found a way to get some of that data, although it wasn't super accessible, um, I think that would have taken it up a notch. We'd really like that top 10 list would be a lot more focused in on like the cities that definitely like need it the most uh, while also taking into account the risk factors and economic need that we wanted to take into account. So yeah, echo what Grace and Ben said, um, but also adding just like get, making that metric a little more precise. Yeah, absolutely. And Hang, how about you? Um, yeah, I think one of the things I would really like to do is to really trust your data. Um, like um, a lot of my group members said, we really stumble on a lot of different um, path changes and we really examine different types of data. And a lot of times I'm just thinking to myself, is this data gonna work? Is it gonna produce a model that's viable? But 
in the end, even though this data, like the one we have is not perfect, for example, like the cholesterol column is supposed to have a high correlation with heart disease, but it didn't. But at the end, it those seemingly unreasonable data did give us a really high accuracy. I think that's what um, our um, a data analyst should do to try to find um, reasonable, reasonable analysis from data that's seemingly useless. So yeah, really trust your data and work with what you have in hand. This, yeah, this was a really, really neat project and well done. I mean, I, I learned a lot. I think when, before we started um, graduation today, I mentioned to, to one of the other associates that that's my favorite part about what you guys do here is you, you really do teach us something. And we learn something so fascinating by the approach you take with the data and what you present to us today. And, and you know that was very clear in this. This was a wonderful presentation, really fascinating, really well done. Congratulations, you guys. You did a great job with this.